Well, hello and welcome to the first of what we hope will be many LOI on OTB podcasts. The aim here is to give you a short and sweet hit of with a quick look back and forward to all the games in the SSE Electricity League. And what a week to kick off with, with another Dublin derby between Shamrock Rovers and Bohemians ready to explode. Camden Docks league title winning procession be stopped with Waterford's Blues continue and see them sucked into an end of season relegation battle and which set of supporters will have their passports ready for next season. I'm joined here in studio, Stephen Doyle here by the way with you. I'm joined by three fellow League of Ireland buffs. Um, I've got Jamie Moore here to my left, beyond him is Enda Cole and Jake O'Donnell as well. Thanks for Thanks coming in lads. Thanks so look, before we get to uh, all of the games this week, there were a couple of games obviously on Monday and Tuesday that we can look back on. Starting up in Oriel Park, um, a Michael Duffy brace to, uh, and one from Pat Hoobin of course in the first half enough to give Dundalk a 3-0 win against UCD so I suppose no surprises there really Jamie Yeah when you saw Dundalk went a couple of goals up early you were worried for UCD given the Friday previous they'd lost to Bowes 10-1 then they beat Pats in the Cup and you're thinking they're going up there possibly to maybe get a point and there a couple of goals in early and you were wondering what Magic Turner Grodsky was thinking in his first league game in charge being down a couple of goals but in the end only to lose three it sounds strange to say they were probably happy not to be beaten by four or five or six because the confidence boost they would have got from the win over Pats it wasn't killed too much because they weren't expected to win Dundalk Yeah absolutely Michael Duffy getting goals eight and nine in the league this season as well Andy he's been absolutely fantastic Well for the last couple of years he's been one of the best players in the Premier, League, or in the Premier Division and if we're being honest he's probably the best quality footballer in the league over the bit in the terms of a technical standpoint, mm. as a winger, he has everything. He can dribble, he can pass, he can shoot, he can, he can score. He has he has everything for me, and he's just such an asset for Dundalk down that left hand side. He's so dangerous. Yeah, absolutely. I suppose UCD, you know, they're coming in into this Jake off the back of a few bad defeats. You know, Rovers not so long ago beat them seven one. That yeah. ten one against Bohemians as well, absolute disaster. And of course, Collie O'Neill departed in um, rather strange circumstance. We never really see UCD boss getting the sack, especially at this stage of the season. But um, well, I know they, they, you know, whatever they, they, they put out in the media there, but as, as Jamie uh, alluded to there, of course, Matty Edge coming in there to UCD, like, what is his job now for the rest of the season? What, what exactly is his aims? I don't know, because, like, I wouldn't... Because uh, I can call you O'Neill just seems so harsh this season now. Like, obviously, UCD, they don't have the resources. A lot of the players are students, like... But the style of football they play is really, really good. I've been down UCD twice this season now, and like they played Pats off the park both times. They played this season once. Pats got one one draw. The time they've lost three one. The style of football is so good. Like they've lost a lot of their best players this season as well. So like, I'm not really sure what the game plan is for UCD. Like they look like they're gonna. So they're coming last, are they now? Yeah, they're last. Yeah, yeah six yeah. points. Yeah. Finn Harps just above them. So I think they're probably gone now this season, to be honest. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's kind of just... But look, they, they might go on a cup run, like the big pats in the cup. Yeah, I was at that game, Steve, and I was really impressed by UCD. I thought, given the 10-1 and the new manager, and they were playing against Pats, that they would drop off and they would try and defend and they would try and, in some ways, keep themselves in the game until the last 10 minutes. They pressed up high. They stopped Pats playing their passing game. They played brilliantly on the counter-attack, scored a couple of great goals, and they have a couple of their players, like Liam Scales, back in the team. His move to the UK didn't happen. He's back in the team. Liam Kerrigan, they've signed from Sligo. Jack Keeney from Sligo, two really good midfield players. And they looked really good, and I wouldn't be surprised. They're six points in it. they played level games with Finn Harp, now 29 games each. They're going to take this to the last three or four games, I think. Yeah towards Harps and then you're looking at the teams above Harps going or Harps going to catch them well there'll be more teams dragged in but UCD given I didn't see the game against Dundalk but given the performance against Pats they'll pick yeah. up more points in the rest of the season Well look we'll come back to that relegation battle later on because we'll be discussing of course um, Finn Harps will be going to be in action this weekend but just moving on then to Tuesday night like Waterford um, played against Shamrock Rovers whom they'd already played the week before I was actually down at that game myself um, Rovers got a 5-1 win down at the RSC I thought they might give Waterford another good hammering it again this yeah. week but I suppose a 2-1 defeat not so bad for Waterford albeit Rovers did make some changes Stephen Bradley took the chance to maybe rotate his, his team in a bit which we'll touch on more I think because that you know brings us up to the Bowes game but I suppose just looking at 2-1 in particular Dean O'Halloran getting the goal for Waterford in the first half which equalised uh, the opener from Graham Cummins and then of course the prodigal son Graham Burke coming back for Rovers and getting his first goal after I think, three or four appearances since his return in the yeah well the big thing for Shamrock Rovers last night was firstly Graham Burke, like you said, getting off the mark again and his, his return to Shamrock Rovers is a really big boost for them going into the final, final furlong of the season, if you want to use a horse analogy. But 
I think another big thing for Shamrock Rovers last night was Aaron McAniff came back. He, he came off the bench and he's going to be a really key player going forward into this Dublin Derby game as well. He's not completely fully fit yet from as far as I could see, but he's just coming in, adding that more ex more experience to the midfield and just solidifying it a little bit. And he's, he's top quality going forward as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I suppose it was really all about three points really for, for Rovers in that game but it, that brings us on then nicely to um, the weekend action and like I have to say I think this is one of the most fascinating sagas in Irish sport not just in football like this it's incredible what's been happening the last couple of years not so good if you're a Rovers fan um, if you're a Bohemians fan you've been really enjoying this over the last couple of years so let's like frame this up basically over the last eight meetings Ro uh, Bohemians have won seven drawn one it's 13-5 uh, to five in aggregate, goals-wise. Rovers have only scored one goal in the last four meetings. And the last four meetings at Tallis Stadium have all been victories for Bohemians. May 2017 was the last time Shamrock Rovers beat Bohemians in a yeah. double derby. It's, That's insane. It's really incredible when you think about it, the fact that Shamrock Rovers had the professional setup. Yeah. Bohemians players really training part-time. Um, what do you put this down to, Jamie? It's hard to say because I've been at a lot of these games, Steve, as have you, because thankfully they're in Dublin and we get to see them all. We'll be both there this Friday. And like you go back to the game when it was like the 97th minute and Daryl Lee pops up with that winner and you're going, there's no time to look there because in what game will there be seven minutes injury time and nine minutes injury time and that happens? But the run has just continued and Bowes have been value for their win in most of those games. Yeah. They really have. And the I game think, plan... I think Rovers maybe felt a little bit hard done by in the last Tallis Stadium game because yeah. the, the, the red cars two, yeah, two centres off. Yeah, yeah. And especially Lee Grace because Lee Grace is such a key man for that Shamrock Rovers defence. Yeah. Um, like, I, I don't know what you thought. And as a neutral yourself... Were they hard done by, do you think, in that game at Tallis Stadium? I'm not sure. Like, if you, I would go further back to the one in Daly Mount prior to that where they might have felt hard done by by the penalty. Yeah. But for me, there was two red cards in Tallis last time. And it's it's really hard to put your finger on what is going wrong with Shamrock Rovers when it comes to Bowes. But I think the emotional side of things can't be underestimated because, like you said, Bowes feel like underdogs going into the game and they're semi-professional, Shamrock Rovers are professional, but for me, Shamrock Rovers are trying to get up for the game as if they're, they're the underdogs, when really what they need to start doing is treating it like we're in second for a reason, we're pushing for the title and Bowes aren't. They need to let their football do the talking rather than letting their emotions get in, and I think that's actually one of the key issues for Shamrock Rovers against Bowes because you can see that they're, they're putting in challenges that they wouldn't normally put in. They're, they're getting booked, they're getting sent off, they're giving away needless penalties all the time against Bowes and that, that for me comes down to the mental side of things more than the quality of the footballers Yeah, I think as well looking at the teams Jake as well, if you kind of look at the, the team that Stephen Bradley selected for Waterford there on Tuesday, like he left um, who was it, it was uh, Jack Burroughs left on the bench, Sean Kavanagh, Aaron McInef, now they, those three players did come on later in the game and Gary O'Neill as well left on the bench, I've, some of Gary O'Neill's performances lately since signing from you know, like there was a lot of talk about Neil Ferrugia, but I think Gary O'Neill has been brilliant for Rovers since he signed for them. But I think leaving those four players on the bench really gives us an insight into what Stephen Bradley's thinking yeah. here. He wants to beat Bohemians on Friday. That's all he's thinking about. It is really. It's huge for Rovers. Like, there was a question we had written down in the notes for today. Is, is this game bigger for Bowes or is it bigger for Rovers? And honestly, I think it's bigger for Rovers, even though they are in second, they have European football secured. But like, it's just breaking that hoodoo now at this stage. Like... It was April 2018 when Bradley infamously said it's Bowes Cup final and they've lost every single game against Bowes now since. Like it is getting embarrassing at this stage considering they are a professional team and Bowes just aren't. Like my question, like does it make Keith Long look a better manager than Bradley and how much is that playing in Bradley's head? Because Bradley has the resources and Long doesn't really to the same extent. Like, Yeah, I, I don't know as well, like, James, because you'd know maybe some of the, 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 the lads who are working as managers and coaches around the league and I think the Bohemians one is interesting because actually I was listening to uh, um, on another podcast which was quite interesting Greg Bulger talking yeah. about Crawley Trevor Crawley of course the assistant manager of Bohemians now Keith Long is obviously a wonderful manager he's done great things with Bohemians but it's the I think the relationship between him and Trevor Crawley is the, the, the really interesting thing as well in this uh, saga between Bowes and Rovers yeah I always compare it to, to Leinster Rugby and to the dynamic between Leo Cullen and Stuart Lancaster it's like a manager and a head coach mm. and like Trevor Crawley takes 99% of the Bowes training. He takes the drills, he takes the, you know, the shape, he takes a lot of it, he plans it. And I think he openly said himself that he's a coach. He was a manager at Shamrock Rovers in Bray, but he's a coach and he loves coaching. And the players love him. 
and apparently the training's outstanding. And then you've got Keith Long, who has signed all these young players, who's found them coming back from the UK. The likes of Danny Mandrews, who came back, Keith has signed them. They've got them on extended contracts for next year. Another example is James Talbot, the goalkeeper. They found them, they've gotten their heads to, to make them want to play for Bohemians and they're doing really good training and their game plans in those games have been spot on in terms of trying to catch Rovers playing out from the back. Like one of the derbies this season in, in Talad, there was a case Shamrock Rovers playing out from the back and Aaron McInef got it off Alan Manis and actually back passed it out for a corner because Bohemians had pressed and perfectly. And if you, were, I'd say, were to watch a Bowes training session on a, on a Thursday and see the game on a Friday, I would suggest you will see the players doing exactly what Trevor has set them up to do which has worked perfectly for them. And the other thing there that Jake mentioned, to, I would love to be a fly on the wall of both dressing rooms at five to eight on Friday night to, to hear what's being said. Is this cup final thing still being used by Bowles? Was it ever used by Bowles? Because certainly the fact that every game has been a, a Bohemian's win since you know, shows that have had the, the upper hand in those games because I think they've deserved them. You've mentioned the red yeah. cards and stuff, but they've deserved them overall. And if like every time these teams meet, we go, Rovers will have to win this one, they'll have to stop this run. And it's just continued. Yeah, I think the interesting thing as well, Enda, is that Bohemians, when you look at their record, defensive record has been excellent this season. They've only conceded 23 goals in the games uh, they've played so far. And I think, at the t especially the last couple of times when they met Rovers, Rovers were struggling slightly maybe in front of goal. Mm -hmm. But when you look over the last couple of games, like obviously Jack Burns chipping in now with some spectacular goals. You've got Aaron Green, who was struggling for a little bit there in front of goal, but he start found his, his scoring boots now again. And maybe that could be the key for Rovers this Friday, that they've got, you know, they've got that confidence in front of goal. Yeah. They're scoring goals. And, you know, maybe they will make that Bohemians defence creak a little. You know, I know Andy Lyons has come in there right back, maybe playing a few more games lately than Derek Pender. Rob Cornwell's back from fitness, which I yeah. think could be key for Bowes. Uh, but James Finley's there, he's got a lot of experience. Daryl Lee, he's got a lot of experience over the last few games. So I think that's going to be that's going to be the really interesting battle maybe this, this Friday night. Yeah, well, I th like you said, like Rovers have goals from everywhere, but I, I, don't, I don't have the stat in front of me now. But Bowes went on a run where they weren't conceding goals except for from set pieces. And set pieces could be a key part in this because Rovers have added the danger man of Graham Cummins in there. He just caused absolute havoc in the box. And when you have a player like Jack Byrne who's going to be delivering balls in there, that's, that's going to be somewhere where, where Shamrock Rovers can possibly target. Yeah. I think midfield's going to be the key battle. Who's going to pick up Jack Byrne? Um, is Keith Ward going to start for Bowes? He hasn't really got a run off starting fixtures in the game or in the Bohemians team yet but he he's more of a I don't know what would you call a luxury player where he can spray these pass around but is he going to sit back and do the job that they want to do on on burn I don't think he is so it's it's going to be interesting to see who Keith uh, Keith Long goes for in the midfield yeah I think, I think Steve oh, sorry yeah. Keith Buckley Keith Buckley on Jack Burn perfect yeah. cuz Keith Buckley is one of these players who he fouls, but he doesn't get booked, and he stands on people's toes, and he just is able to get round people. And Jack Byrne has had such a good season. I think if you frustrate him and you get into and you get into him, and Keith Buckley would love that in Talla, the mm -hmm. Rovers fans on him, giving away you know fouls and stuff. I think he could be the perfect man. I know he's had some issues this last couple of weeks with injury, but if he's fit, put him on Jack Byrne, and, and that's yeah. a massive. But the problem then is Rovers have so many other players well, that that's if Jack Byrne isn't well, on the ball. Do you think? I, I think that as well. Like, and I, I don't know what Jay thinks as well. The, the fact that you know Jack Byrne has shown how he can score from from a good distance outside yeah. the box especially against Waterford we're talking 22 23 yard screamers here and that you know Stephen Bradley was he'd said that he's trying to encourage Jack Byrne to shoot more from, from long range so that's definitely something Bowles will have to watch especially Keith Buckley and Connor Levingston as well in that uh, that double midfield pivot yeah no honestly like I think this is Jack Byrne's game like this is he's performed domestically he's now getting the Ireland call ups he's lost it in Europe like he's been best player in the league in Europe probably in years but he just hasn't performed when they played Bowes this year now like he got subbed off at half time I think in the first game of the season I don't think that was injury related I'm not really sure why that was but it's just the one last thing that he needs to do now to really sort of cement himself as the best player in the league I think Jack Byrne now Likewise for Rovers though do you think they go five in the midfield for the night that's in it because we're talking about Jack Byrne here but Bohemians have that same threat in the middle of the field with Mandreu sitting true. And also the as well in the last couple of games the new signing Andre Wright who's played really well um, I think he, he kind of got off to a slow start but the game against Shelburne in the Cup he, he really came into form mm -hmm. and since then he's been a really good link man I think for, for the, the Bohemians midfield and their, their attacking play so that again is another new challenge that Rovers will have to deal with is, is Andre Wright he's a big physical player he's going to be a hard man to, uh, to deal with so I just it's it's fascinating 
really all over the pitch. Um, the other thing as well is that Joey O'Brien, um, I know speaking to Bradley and myself last week, Joey O'Brien was meant to come back for the Waterford game. I think they've held him back as well. I think he might come in for Ethan Boyle, yep. our right back. And I also think Neil Ferrugia, he's been back back training, might be a game too early for him, but... Off the bench, he'd be a say he might stick him on the bench and another man who, who could be a, a and really key I'd player. be interested to see who Seaman Bradley's going to pick up front because he has looked at Graham Burke there, he has Graham Cummins, he has Aaron Green. Yeah. Like, they're all not going to play and I think that will determine the style because Graham Cummins, as the lads mentioned, wants to get the ball in the box. Graham Burke wants to get the ball to his feet and won't run in behind. So, you might play Aaron McInef as a 10 and he can, he can get off the striker but the selection for Seaman Bradley now with that squad to try and pick midfield and the attacking options with Neil Farouge coming back like there's going to be good players sitting in the stand not even on the bench Yeah. which looking at that squad you're going they, they, I just have a feeling they could, they could win this game Steve. Speaking of the stand there's 1200 tickets sold by Bohemians for this game I would imagine Rovers are going to sell a good four to five thousand. We, you know, we had over six thousand at the last game in Tallis Stadium I think we could, could be pushing seven thousand here and that's without Friday opening night. half of the the new stand, yeah, well, which is a really they're, strange decision. I'm not sure why it's been made. It's probably for safety wise restrictions. Yeah, I think but so. It, yeah, it's just a pity that they don't it's do it shame. because it for a game like Bose. I know it, it, there's an added layer of attention, so there's pr- you probably have to add security costs onto it, and that's something that Rovers obviously have considered. But it just it's such a shame seeing such a, a new stand half empty. Yeah, for such a big game when you know it would be full if it was uh, if it was open. Absolutely. Well, look, I'm sure the the atmosphere is going to be absolutely electric out there on Friday night. I really can't wait for the game. I'm not going. Before we move on to the next one, we'll have a, we'll have a quick, t- you know, see what you guys think prediction wise, Jamie. It's Rovers for me. I think they'll win the game. Rovers. Yeah. I'm going to go for a draw. Draw, Jake. I think it's Rovers time. I think it's Jack Burns game. Uh, I think it's going to be Rovers as well. I have a funny feeling this this is Bradley's going to pull all his his eggs into this basket for this weekend. Awesome. The Bulls team will just use our video this week as opposed to Stephen Bradley's comments. <laughs> We're all tipping Rovers, Steve. <laughs> right. So listen, we'll move on to the the rest of the day's games. Like I suppose we we did say at the start of the podcast, it's just really a short and sweet hit for for anybody going to matches and just to get our view and, and a little bit of insight into all the games. So look, looking next at Cork City and Sligo Rovers, um, this one down at Turner's Cross. Cork City coming into this game off the back of that FAI Cup defeat to Galway United. Sligo Rovers, of course, beating Limerick in the FAI Cup. And head-to-head this this season, they've um, it's been all uh, draws. Well, the last two games, uh, it was a 1-1 up at uh, the showgrounds. Before that, Turner's Cross, it was a 0-0 draw. And before that, again, up at the showgrounds, Cork City had a 2-1 win. Neil Fenn coming in from Longford Town for his first game. Let's not get into the politics of what happened regarding his appointment. I know Longford weren't happy about it. I know it might have been, uh, you know, well handled down at Cork City. But look, that's for other people to discuss in other podcasts. But let's just look at the game itself. Neil Fenn, he was going so well with Longford Town. A really good manager, Jamie. Can he turn things around um, between now and the end of the season? What's he looking to do? Yeah, I spoke to Neil on our podcast earlier on, our other League of Ireland podcast here with Off the Ball, and he wants the team to play a passing style. That's what he said. That's what the club has said to him. They want him to play a style of football that's a passing style. And I'll be very interested to see the team he picks and what the players do because under John Caulfield and under John Cotter as the caretaker manager in recent months, Cork have been a direct team. Yes, they have footballers who can play and midfielders and stuff, but how often have their centre-backs got the ball off the goalkeeper and played out from the back? Not very often because they've not been asked to do it by the managers. And you've now got eight, nine, ten games left and the manager has two sessions this week to try and get his team ready to play Friday and then they play water for the home on Monday. So how, how, how long will Neil have with them on the training pitch to instill his style or does he maybe leave them with their current style at the end of this season, make his signings and look at things next season. But he did say they're also looking behind them to go, we need to make sure we don't get caught by the team who's ninth or get dragged into that. Yeah. So it's a mid-table finish and points in the next two games, home to Sligo and home to Water for teams in the bottom half of the table are games where Cork should be aiming to get four to six points from for me. Jake, um, former Pats boss Liam Buckley of course took charge of Sligo Rovers this season um, and they were down at Inchicore not so long ago, a 2-1 win for the Saints against uh, their old boss yeah. but um, they've just been so hot and cold this season Sligo Rovers haven't they? Yeah I think that Sligo have been like that the last few years but I think also Buckley's been like that the last few years when he was yeah. with Pats as well I think he, so he lost Mikey Drennan he lost Reese McCabe at the start of the season when he thought he was going to have them for the season so that obviously that didn't help they haven't got the players he's wanted and that's just, just sort of been the story of Buckley and Sligo over the last few years so just another mid-table finish really and I suppose build again next year and hopefully he has the players that commit to him 
Yeah, I suppose where they they're Sligo Rovers now in the table, just looking there, sixth place. Like it's they they can't really and look they're they're what eleven points off Pat's there in fifth. So I don't know. End up like yeah. if you're Sligo Rovers support, it's probably a really a bit of a damn squib for the rest. I of the don't season, know. It? It's 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 the same of same story of Sligo Rovers the last couple of years. They don't have the budget to compete with their other teams, and they're struggling with that, and they struggle on the road as well. So to be honest, with the new manager bounce, I can see Cork picking up a handy enough win. Yeah, uh, this Friday. Yeah, would you say the same, Jake? Yeah, I think it'll be close. Like I think they are evenly matched sides. If Cork can perform, a, a, I'll go for a draw. To be honest, Jamie. Yeah, I think I think a Cork win. I'm just looking at the table, Steve. Oh, Sligo are only nine points off ninth. Yeah, like they're yeah. closer to ninth than they are to the top four. Yeah, and if Finn Harps were to go a couple of wins, Finn Harps are in, in form. We spoke about Waterford and Cork looking over their shoulders. Sligo. You know they're mid-table, but they're not that far from that. And a couple of results, you're you're, you're looking behind. you going into the last five, six games, still having to play these teams. Going, we could be under a little, but I think a big crowd in turners across the road Cork on to a win. Yeah. Watch your house. Waterford versus Derry as well on Friday night. Waterford at home in this game, and uh, you know I, I thought it was interesting actually. They arrested Corey Galvin for the Shamrock Rovers game. Really good player. I think the Derry game might have been one they were targeting, looking to get the three points because again, Waterford down there, third from bottom place. Um, they're only sorry, third from yeah, third from bottom, four points above Finn Harps who are second from bottom albeit with a game in hand but they need to be careful of getting something yeah. to that relegation battle as well don't they this is, a ma- this is a massive game for Derry though because they have to go away and win this knowing that Bowes could pick up points against Shamrock Rovers and if Bowes pick up points against Shamrock Rovers that could be decide the European title race yeah. uh, but it, Waterford are just in free fall at the minute yeah. they've six league losses in a row haven't won since May yeah regardless well, and that's down to the European football. Yeah. It was taken away from them. Whatever about the circumstances, it's been raked over quite a lot. But and they've lost, lost a couple of players, lost on, a lot the, of players. on the back of that as well. So it's yeah. been difficult for them this year and it's going to be difficult for them next year, but they just need to make sure they stay in the league they first get points. Forward. Can they beat Derry on Friday night? I don't think so. I think that's going to be... Because Derry were very impressive against Dundalk in the Cup. Even though yeah. they lost, they're starting to pick up form. They, there's a good feeling around Derry at the minute. The confidence is high, so I think they'll pick up a handy enough win. Jake? Yeah, I'd back Derry to be honest. Like, well, they're not just looking at Bose, they're looking at Pats now coming behind them as well with a new manager coming in there. So I think they will want to be coming in fourth, third. So I'd be backing them to perform at the end of the season, yeah. Jamie, Bally Buffet. Nobody likes going up there. That's where St. Pats Correct. are going on a Friday night. It's the, one of the toughest places to win. It's uh, it's an old league of Ireland myth, but there's a lot of truth to it as well. Yeah, the pitch up there in the summertime is actually okay. In the wintertime, it's horrendous. And... The thing with Bally Buffet is for the away teams, the crowd are so close to the pitch that it can be very intimidating. And people in Bally Buffet and Finn Harps, the Finn Harps fans, they don't like the clubs from Dublin. They don't like the managers. And, and there's a little, when you're walking in, into the dressing rooms in Bally Buffet, there's a little like tunnel. It's like you're going into prison, right? And there's a big steel fence and all the Finn Harps fans come up to you and shout at you and scream at you. And it's quite intimidating. <laughs> and if Harps get a run going in terms of like in the game, some momentum and their crowds have been improving a little bit, you're going, it's a, it's a tough place to go. It really yeah. is, it really is. And, and they've had such a good run. They're looking to catch the teams ahead of them. They're looking to stay ahead of UCD. They've, they've got a chance to pick up points in this game. I like going to Bob Faye, just putting that out there. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good place. It's a nice place. Uh, Finn, Jake. Park, Finn Park, not so much, but Bob Faye's a nice town. <laughs> Well, look, I suppose Harry Kenny being let go by St. Pat's uh, was the big news, yeah. Jake. So, um, you know, what, what's your thoughts as a, as a St. Pat's man yourself going up to uh, Donegal at the weekend? I wouldn't have any faith in us, to be honest, until the end of the season now or until we get a new manager in. It was interesting, Harry Kenny, like, I think he didn't expect, well, he resigned officially. That's what mm. a lot of happens now with managers. But, like, after the game on Friday, he was speaking to Extra Time.e and he was saying we have seven games to go now, we want to pick up points, we still have stuff to play for. So I don't think he really wanted to go yet or was ready to go. But I suppose the fans are on his back at the end of the game against UCD. So that's happened there. And now Gerard Bryan looks to be taking this game. Going up to Bally Buffet, I wouldn't have much faith. Like Gerard Bryan's been there for the last two seasons. Just hasn't been good enough. The play hasn't been good enough. There hasn't been game plans. I wouldn't have a lot of faith in Pats now. Mm. Looking at the end of the season, like pushing for Europe, to be honest. Yeah, well, maybe a bit of time over the next few games. Jerry might cobble something together. Um, I have a feeling of just a funny feeling for Ollie always seems to get the results towards the end of the season. I, I think Finn Harps might get a, get a win this game. He's solidified it. And I was, if you look at uh, Harps' fixtures going forward, the next four fixtures, St. Pat's at home, Sligo away, Cork away, UCD at home. The potential for 10 points there. Yeah. And I said it while UCD were ahead of uh, Harps the two games in hand as well. Harps have more of a chance surviving through the playoff system than UCD do, in my opinion. They're just set up for that. 
and I think Harps are going to survive this year. I didn't think that in the mid-season. I thought they were completely gone. Yeah. But you you got to give Ollie credit for what he does. It's not nice to look at, but with the budget and with the players they have, he the, the, just manages to somehow yeah, keep a them in the league. Job up there, yeah. Well, we can touch on that, uh, the playoff stuff, especially more next week. And uh, just to finish up, because um, I said we want to keep this short and sweet, and uh, UCD Dundalk, I think, um, I can't see this result going anyway, Bar Dundalk, Wayne Jamie, can yeah, you? Yeah, I'll be very interested to see what UCD do, because they've only just played them on Monday, and the flip is, is quite quick, and we know Dundalk have full-time you know, staff and football to get themselves ready, and the squad Dundalk have, Vinnie Pert, can make as many changes as he wants, probably from Monday to Friday for this game. So yeah, you would think of the Dock win. And Rovers are still, you know, with the with the Dock haven't played their game in hand, they're still close enough that if the Dock lose a game or two, it'll get tight. So they need to keep winning, and they will, I would think, beat beat UCD on Friday. UCD win, lads. <laughs> what do you think? It'll be a matter of keeping it below six goals, I would say, for yeah. UCD. Yeah, it's going to be a tough one. I think the other girls, that's all I'll say. Yeah. Well, listen, there you go, folks. Um, I suppose all the focus this week was on the Dublin Derby. We wanted to keep it on that. Uh, but over the next couple of weeks, hopefully we can give you a bit more insight and all to, into all the other clubs and uh, we'll keep this going and uh, see what we can do. So for the moment, anyway, though, thanks, Jake. Thanks, Enda. Thanks, Cheers, Jamie. Steve-o. Cheers, Steve-o. Enjoy the match so Friday night, folks. We'll talk to you again soon.